I mean, they run you to death. You're hungry. You go home and you sleep and blah, blah, blah. I go, I go, what? These kids don't have any men in their lives pushing them from 3 p.m. to 7 p.m. so that they're too tired to be out because that's what I was. I was run to death from playing sports and doing all kinds of other activities. I didn't have time to do dumb stuff. Finishing up with Jason Whitlock of Fox Sports. Now, when I say finishing up, I mean we could probably do seven hours. I want to ask you a little bit about what you think of Roger Goodell and what you think of the future of Roger Goodell right now. I think he's in a little bit of trouble, and I think he's been compromised by the controversies. But I'm, I haven't given up on him. I think he can rebound and pivot and move to a better place. Is that better place... They just spent $100 million or committed $100 million to try to learn more about CTE. And not only that, but I believe that about $40 million of that is going to go to entrepreneurs to invent a better helmet. And not only that, not only to invent a better helmet, but I remember a couple of years ago in training camp with the Cardinals, Patrick Peterson said... It reminded me of the NRA thing where the only way you'll get me to get rid of my gun is to get it out of my dying hands. Patrick Peterson said, I've been wearing this helmet since I went to LSU. I love this helmet. I don't want to get rid of it. Guys get enamored of their helmets. And in my opinion, I know this is going to sound absurd, but one of the things the NFL needs to do is to get together with the Players Association and enforce them to wear the helmet with the best technology. But anyway, I, I, I didn't want to steal that. But what do you think long-term Goodell has to do to kind of get his grip back on the job and to stay long-term? I, I think you, you're actually on to something with the helmets. It leads me to a better uh, uh, the point I would like to make. He needs a better relationship with the NFL Players Association. And I get beat up when I defend Gene Upshaw, but I don't care. Gene Upshaw had the proper relationship with NFL ownership. It was a partnership. He was a former player, didn't have this over-the-top hostility towards ownership, understood that, you know, hey, football's rough and tough, but at the level of money these guys are making, it's sort of moving towards a fair exchange. And we would be better off billionaires and millionaires partnering up and how can we make this business better more safer, more profitable for all of us. And so, again, Roger Goodell has to get out of the discipline business because that puts him at odds with the players. He gets out of that. He he continues to work on the concussion front and the helmet deal. But I think maybe just as important, the NFL needs to aggressively take charge of telling football story. They need to take ownership of all of football and start using their players, former and current, to start telling football story. They got guys like Ray Lewis that can tell this story. Here's another people. I'll defend Ray, and I, I don't think Ray's been a perfect person. I don't know what happened in Atlanta, but I do know this. Football has helped Ray Lewis become a better person. Football, I think, saved Ray Lewis's life. Without question. And so you take the Ray Lewis's and other players. Because it's not just black players. It's white players as well. They all got these stories. And you start telling and giving people the understanding how much wealth has been transferred to the black community through football. How many scholarship opportunities. Because it's not even just big time Division One. Football provides opportunities for NAIA, all kinds of schools, taking guys out of some really rough situations. It's almost like what the military used to do through the draft. You take an 18-year-old kid, put him out in the stick somewhere for three or four months during basic training, ship him off overseas, open his eyes to the world. And then two, three years later, you drop him back off in his hometown. He's like, oh, I see the world in a much different way. And that's what football does. It it. I'm just t- it took a meathead like me and really educated me and set me on a path towards 
just so much a greater understanding of, of America, the world, my place in it, what I was capable of doing, what we as African Americans are capable of doing. It, it teaches so many values. And again, it's certainly not perfect. And any coach of mine, particularly in college, that's listening to that, listening to this, is going, <laughs> <He's Holy thinking. laughs> God, Whitlock was a headache. He was a locker room lawyer. But damn, he's admitting that we helped him along the way. And they did. Paul Shadell. Lawrence Cooley, great coach of mine. He's passed on. I love the guy. Even Dave Magazine, the coach in the NFL for a long time. He coached me. He was my offensive line coach at Ball State first two years. Hated that guy's guts my first two years at Ball State and for a long time. But he helped me. And, again, it's like sausage, man. You don't want to see how it gets made, but it tastes good on the other side. That's what football is. Jason Whitlock, it's been a lot of fun. Thank you for joining me. And uh, we'll have to do another three hours one day. Thank you, Peter. I appreciate you having me. This is the MMQB Podcast. Podcast. Before we go, a few thoughts about what everybody's calling a controversy, and I call it an embarrassment of riches. That's the Dallas Cowboys quarterback situation. Everybody wants to know after this bye week, who should Jerry Jones and Jason Garrett install at quarterback? The longtime incumbent, Tony Romo, or this year's quarterback wonderkind, Dak Prescott from Mississippi State, who's 5-1 and one replacing Tony Romo. Now, I don't know about you, but when I root for a team, and I really only root for one, that's the Boston Red Sox, but when I root for a team, if you told me that I could have Clayton Kershaw and David Price as my first and second pitchers, I don't think I'd be very worried about, well, who's the number one and who's number two? Just throw them out there. And the same thing with this. At some point this season, the Dallas Cowboys are going to need, in the last 10 weeks of the season, they're going to need Dak Prescott and Tony Romo. Obviously, they can't take Dak Prescott out of the lineup right now. He's just playing too well. Has a quarterback rating well over 100, thrown one interception, so far in four preseason games and six regular season games. It's it's insane how good he is. And by the way, talking to Prescott this week, one of the most interesting things that he said, he sounded just like Carson Wentz. One of the most interesting things was he said, hey, it's just football. I think everybody on the outside, including me sometimes, wants to make the NFL much bigger than it actually is. But If you just realize this is the same game you've played since you were in seventh grade, you're going to be okay if you're good enough. Dak Prescott certainly is good enough. So what I say to all the Dallas Cowboy fans out there and all of you listening to this, don't be so caught up in who's going to play. It's probably going to be Prescott, but if for some unforeseen reason uh, Jason Garrett says my guy is, is Tony Romo, big deal. You now have what no other team in the NFL has, and that's two quarterbacks who tomorrow could win a playoff game for you. Nobody else has that. Maybe New England, but really nobody else has proven winners at that position. Multiple winners. And right now, if I'm a Dallas Cowboys fan, I just sit back and enjoy it. Thanks to my guests, Rich Eisen and Jason Whitlock this week. If you enjoyed these conversations, Be sure to listen and subscribe to other great episodes in the MMQB series, such as my interviews with Drew Brees, John Elway, and Michael Bennett of the Seattle Seahawks. You can find these on the MMQB.com or on iTunes or anywhere you get your podcasts. And don't forget to leave a review while you're there. Listen to other podcasts in our series as well with Albert Breer, Gary Gramling, and Andy Benoit of the MMQB. Thanks to the folks at Digital Media for their production work. And thanks, of course, to my sponsors. SeatGeek, ZipRecruiter, Stamps.com, and Movement Watches. Please support them the way they support this podcast. And I'll see you next week. This has been a Digital Media production. Find your voice.